Today I want to talk about the importance of testosterone for women. And I have to tell you, I learned this firsthand. I um, had my ovaries out because of endometriosis, and that was back in 2002. And it was a devastating thing, because when I woke up, I wasn't myself. And that had a lot to do with not having any hormones at all, but I was considered the hormone queen in, in St. Louis. I had been doing bioidentical hormones since 1986, and everybody sent their problems to me. So I wake up and I, don't, I have terrible problems with even getting out of bed, no motivation. I gained 20 pounds in a month. Um, I didn't think the same. My mental capacity was bad. So I have gone to everyone in our area, and they, they called me lazy, fat, crazy. Um, I was sent to psychiatrists. Just, and now I have patients that tell me the same thing, the same rigmarole. They, I didn't find anybody who was doing testosterone treatment or even estrogen in a bioidentical fashion that worked back in 2002. So by God's grace, I met Gino Tutera, who's Mr. Soto Pele now, or Dr. Soto Pele now. But, but then he was just Dr. Tutera, and he treated me. And I was better so fast. But people without ovaries feel better really fast because they are miserable. So I slept for the first time in years that first night of after having the pellets, and I thought it was going to be, that was like, that must be placebo effect, but I've been sleeping ever since. And before that, I had terrible migraines. I couldn't go to work. They carried me out. Every, every week, I'd go out a couple times. They'd have to cancel patients. That's a horrible thing for a physician, and I was on call as well then. So basically, Gino Tutera saved me by giving me testosterone and estro estradiol pellets, and then I asked him to train me. And that was the beginning of what I do now. I slowly brought my practice into away from OBGYN and into age management medicine. And that has happened over the last 12 years. And I am so happy. I have the best life. If you do this and you have women come in and tell you how wonderful your therapy is every day, it's almost as good as delivering babies, but you don't have to get up at night. So... I'm in, trying to encourage you to do this. So this just gives you my credentials, my, and this is on your, um, on your computer, whatever you downloaded. Okay, so for all of those of you who are <clears throat> obsessive-compulsive, I'm sure there's nobody like that in here, these are, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about testosterone deficiency, what it is, what the long-term effects are, the physiology of testosterone in women, but that's going to be very brief, because I've got lots to talk about, how to diagnose testosterone in uh, low testosterone in women, comparison of the different delivery systems, like transdermal versus vaginal versus pellet therapy, ideal dosage, what blood labs you should get, what levels we should, you should look at, troubleshooting, which is the biggest part of this, is how do we take a patient who has an unusual side effect, or an unusual to us, and how do we fix that? So troubleshooting is key to being a good um, bioidentical testosterone pellet therapist for patients. And even with creams and gels, it's the same issue. And then my benediction, which is I learned how to speak in church, so <clears throat> which may or may not be good for you guys. So um, this is, let me go back one. This is a new toy for me. So this is basically what my patients look like. Their, head, their, their face is on my desk. This is a dinner table. But their face is on my desk. They're exhausted. They can't even hold their heads up when they come in, when they have true testosterone deficiency. This patient was it that we're going to speak about to give you kind of a, a notion of what kind of patient I see. Professional woman, 47 years old. Um, she had her ovaries out like I did. Her symptoms began immediately after surgery, which made her very angry about having a hysterectomy. But People need hysterectomies, and they need their ovaries out. And so it wasn't about the hysterectomy. It was about what happened after. So she did the same thing as uh, I did. She sought all kinds of uh, different opinions, and everyone was very unfriendly to her, thought she was just lying, which is, I guess, what we do if we don't know what to do next. So she saw every specialty. But this is what she looked like. She looked exhausted. 
She, she was round, and she showed me a picture of herself like you would at a plastic surgeon. Here's what I used to look like, she said. This doesn't look like me anymore. She had fat on the back of her neck like Cushing's. She was pale. All of her, her skin was sagging, kind of like um, she had no blood flow to her face. Basically, if you don't have testosterone, you divert all of your blood flow to the internal organs because you're old, you must be old, and you must not need blood flow to your face. So that's why people look old when they don't have testosterone. She was swollen, she was puffy around the eyes and the fingers. It's things you can just look at with, when patients have their clothes on. So these were the symptoms that she gave me. And these are common. These are, these are so common that when you see this group of symptoms, you have to first think testosterone deficiency before you think of it, anything else. All of these were new onsets since she had her hysterectomy. She had a few of them to begin with because she was 47. Like her sleep wasn't great before, but now it was terrible. She also complained of hot flashes because no one would give her estrogen because everybody was so afraid of, of giving somebody estrogen that they might have a blood clot or something. They hadn't read all the articles about giving estrogen in a non-oral fashion that causes you not to have a blood clot, and bioidenticals are, of course, less risk as well. But she had all of these symptoms. She had gone to some of the doctors and gotten bioidentical estrogen. That's great, but it didn't work for her bioidentical progesterone, all those different types, that didn't work. And she didn't take them all at once. She took them in series instead of in parallel. Somebody gave her diet pills, made her t a tiny bit better. She didn't lose an ounce. And I had antidepressants made her a little happier. Her sleep was terrible still on Ambien. But when we gave her testosterone, and this is what, what I treated her with, she came back and said, I got my life back. I am so much better in three months she came back with her new lab. I do lab tests beforehand. I do lab tests at three-month mark, and then I see my patients. She had one pellet of pure testosterone and one pellet of testosterone and Arimidex because her estrone was very high. So I didn't want... Estrone is, is made... I'll show you later, but it's made in the... Um, made by um, conversion from testosterone, made in the fat and made in the adrenal gland. And when testosterone goes down... Estrone goes up. So her testosterone had been low, so I was trying to help her get her weight back in action. So I gave her 90 milligrams of, tes of testosterone and 10 of Arimidex, which is much lower than the oral dose of one milligram a day of, of Arimidex, divided by 120. Oh, 100 of testosterone and, and 90. One pellet is 100. The other one was 90 plus the 10 of Arimidex. It's mixed together. So she had 190 of testosterone. That's not, I mean, that's not unusual in, in pellets, and it's not, but I was trying to get her out of her, I mean, out of her depression and all these other symptoms. I would probably lower it the next round, but I don't usually go below 175. Um, <clears throat> okay, so she had resolution of all of her symptoms. So what we're trying to do here, if you think about it, is resolve symptoms. We're not trying to get a number. It's not, it, we make the same mistake with thyroid. We're always trying to hit a number. We're not trying to treat the patient. So here, you're trying to treat the patient. So you look at all of her symptoms, and you follow them. You follow lab, but more, the lab is really not about comparing her to other people, but comparing her to herself. You can look at her estrone level. You can look at her estradiol level. You can also look at her testosterone level. But if she feels good, that's where you find that's her perfect level. It's all individualized. And we're trying to hit that perfect place where she feels really good and then stay there. So she had a weight loss. She was 5'4", weighed 130 when it was over. So that's awesome. But she had improved muscle mass. So what I tell people is, don't weigh yourself every day. You measure your waist once a week, once a month, whatever's comfortable with you. Because that's where you're going to start losing weight. You gain muscle. So at first you don't lose anything but you get smaller, get more compact. So when I'm diagnosing testosterone deficiency, I don't look just at lab or just at symptoms. I look at all of them. I look at the interview. I ask all the questions that are necessary to ask somebody who's miserable. Not just do you sleep, but do you have the kind of, of sleep disturbance that people with testosterone deficiency have, which is I go to sleep because I'm exhausted, I wake up at 2 o'clock, which everybody thinks is depression, 
which isn't always depression. I wake up at 2 o'clock, I wander around, I can't do anything, I can't do anything productive, I go back to sleep, and I wake up tired. That's a terrible night's sleep, and that is getting you nowhere in terms of feeling good the next day. So non-restful sleep is very common when people have low testosterone. So I go through interview, and I go through the complete medical history, past medical history, <clears throat> which will tell me a lot about head injuries. As you know, head injuries can decrease. I mean, if somebody didn't have a hysterectomy, I'm looking for a reason why, if they're, if they're young, why they have a low testosterone. So head injury is one of the reasons. For, women, for these women, I look at their past GYN history, if they've had ovaries removed, and, and, and if they've had endometriosis and still have ovaries, oftentimes I'm looking to see if that's the case because I've found, and this is not in any study, so just keep this, wipe this off your brain after I say it, but many more women in my practice that have had endometriosis have low testosterone. Now, I don't know. I haven't found a study that, that backs that, but that's just what I've noticed. So we're going to go over the lab value, values later, but why testosterone is important for women? Well, it is three times as much, there's three times as much testosterone in women as estradiol, and this is from, um, I mean, it's in several studies, but I quoted it from Carolyn Bondi and her, this is her, um, I got permission to use her graph. Testosterone is there above the estradiol, and that's, that is testosterone level, estradiol level through the years as people go through from uh, birth to 62. So you can see that that's true. So then why do they say it's not a woman's hormone? I guess... It's simplification. It makes it easier to say men are from Mars, women are from Venus, men have testosterone, women have estradiol. I'm not sure, but it's causing a lot of trouble for us getting testosterone and actually having insurance reimbursement if they won't acknowledge that it's our hormone. That's, the one, that's one of the studies that I send to insurance companies. So testosterone's role is much the same as men's. If you think of what men get out of testosterone, we get the same stuff too, but we don't have commercials. Nobody's out there pitching it for us, but we get the same stuff. I mean, we get great muscle and bone. We get, we get a waistline back, I mean, guys do too, but we get our energy, our motivation. And remember that memory part? Any women in here who have not replaced your testosterone yet, but when you can't remember the label for something like that great restaurant, that best friend down the street, the street number of your daughter, I mean, if you, when you can't, Remember a label, that's low testosterone. And that is one of the things I ask people specifically to see if I really need to look at them closely and if I need to give them more or if I need to actually decide that I have to look at something else to, to take care of their symptoms. But you can see all, the, all of these, that's the role in women and men. The mechanism of action depends on, on the tissue, depends on the um, <clears throat> androgen receptor, and it depends on how it turns the tissue on. So the mechanism of action is anabolic activity. We know that. Everybody who's female knows that we make more muscle when we have our testosterone. And as we get older, we don't have as defined muscles. And we get more fat in the muscles, like marbling in a steak. It's lovely. Then uh, it's a vasodilator. So that's why it helps men have erections and have, helps us prepare for sex by swelling. Um, it's an immune stimulator, which is great because as we get older, our immune system tanks. And so this is something to help your immune system come back. That's why we give testosterone to AIDS patients, because it stimulates their immune system so that they can fight cancers. It's not because we want to make them happy. It's because we, we are trying to make them not get an, yet another problem as a cancer. So for us, aging, our immune system is going down. Why don't we bump it up a little bit, and this is one of the good things testosterone does for us. Bone growth. All these drugs that we have for bones, it's not making good bone. We've had lots of lectures about this in the past. Give testosterone instead of all of those medicines. They're expensive. They don't make strong bone. They make brittle bone, and people still break their hip. It's, it's useless. It looks great on x-ray. That's it. So we're treating the x-ray. So instead, if you replace testosterone and or estrogen in women, you can build great bone. And that's much more important than saying, oh, yeah, 
I gave this woman Fosamax to your drug rep. Endocrine stimulator, that's, that's a thing that what I'm referring to there is that testosterone stimulates other glands to make other hormones like growth hormone. Growth hormone stimulated by testosterone. I always see growth hormone go up after I give testosterone. So I tell my patients, this is a twofer. You're getting growth hormone because your, your testosterone is stimulating it. And it's safe. It doesn't cause diabetes that way. It doesn't cause other diseases that way. So testosterone also protects women from these diseases. It makes you less insulin resistant. We talked about bones. It actually decreases cholesterol. It decreases inflammation. So it decreases heart disease and stroke. Fibromyalgia, that's amazing. These fibromyalgia patients have nowhere to go. No one's taking care of them. And they're being given pain meds and things like that. But they're not better. So I give them, I give them testosterone. They always have low testosterone because they're old, usually older by the time they get to me. But even some of the young women have low testosterone. When I treat them with testosterone, they don't have pain anymore. It is miraculous, and they are so excited to be better. It's amazing. It's, it's like that with other autoimmune disorders as well. I have um, one patient who has rheumatoid arthritis, and she's had it for 10 years, and she sat in a chair looking at the wall for 10 years. And she's maxed out her drugs. So I, sent, so I treated her. And I said, I can't promise you anything because I don't know how far this has gone in your joints. And she came in. I didn't recognize her. She walked in my door in my office and said, hi. You know, I'm, and I said, who? <laughs> wasn't the same person. It just wasn't. She said, I just painted the whole inside of my house. I am so well, and I take no other drugs but testosterone. Now, I don't expect everybody to get that. But that was a miracle, and that was just testosterone and a little bit of estrogen. It made all the difference. And there are lots of research articles in the rheumatology journals, if you want to look. Just look at the keywords for autoimmune disorder and testosterone, and you'll find them. The others, you, you know, frailty. We've talked about that this week. Excuse me. Okay, testosterone and libido. The big thing, everybody talks about sex. They love to talk about sex. But my view on sex is that everybody deserves to have sex their whole life. It's not like you're 40 and it's over, which is what all the younger people think. Or, I mean, not all of them, but many young people think that. And they treat us like we're over the hill or we're grossing them out if we talk about wanting a, lib a libido. So testosterone's the libido, queen, king, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and it is the key to libido. If there's no abuse, if there's no sexual abuse in the history of a patient, and they've always been okay with sex with this current partner, you give them testosterone, it's back. This is, this is the key to this. And everybody acts like it's, oh, barely works. I don't know what they're giving people, but they must not be giving them enough testosterone because it brings it back. And some of my patients who have always had low testosterone or have been on the birth control pill all the time, they get their orgasms they've never had. They've never, 30 years, they've never had an orgasm being married to the same guy. They come in and they go, I know what it is. This is awesome. Our marriage is so much better. And I get flowers from their husbands, which is always nice. So women need testosterone to be productive and healthy after 40. They need to be emotionally balanced. And I'm sure all of you men would really appreciate that. And we need to be sexually active throughout our lives. So why is it a secret? Why is everybody not talking about this? The current culture believes that men, well, older men marry younger women. But it's not really accepted still that older women marry younger men. So women are not sexual beings after a certain point, And that's just a shame. So part of this is that culture doesn't, our culture doesn't want to think about this. I'm not sure that that's true in Europe, but it is here. So nobody wants to talk about sex after 40 in women. So that's one of the reasons we don't get to talk, we don't hear about testosterone. Another one is it costs money. Giving testosterone to women is yet another thing that the government has to pay for. So this is one of those things that oh, we're just going to cut, cut women out of this deal like they did in England. They used to allow women in England to have both estrogen and testosterone pellets. Whoops, sorry. Um, and they, they then 10 years ago said, oh, National Health Insurance, insurance or National Health Service has decided that it's for the worried well. Women don't really need this. We're taking it away. 
So all the doctors that, that were expert at this quit doing it. And I thought maybe some of them still remain, but we went to England a month ago and didn't find too many doctors in England still doing it. And that's a big shame because they really were good at that. Dr. Studd is from England. He did lots of the early research. He's still doing it, but I'm not sure where he gets his pellets because they've made it very difficult. So I'm going to go back one. So last is gender bias. We've been reading a lot about that. Gender bias in research, gender bias in money spent on drugs and medical problems. So we're battling that. And in the middle of that, we have something that we need research on. And, we need, and it's the same hormone that men have research on, but we're not getting the dollars for it. And I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know enough about governmental spending on research to understand why that's true. Okay, so the roadblocks to people knowing this. You need to know this if you're talking to patients and they say, why haven't I heard this? Well, it's an orphan medical specialty. Most of the research is done in endocrinology journals. Endocrinology rarely takes care of sex hormones. But they've got tons of stuff in those journals about pregnancy and all kinds of estrogen and testosterone issues for both men and women, but endocrinologists aren't using it. So that information never crosses over to ACOG or urology. So it's an orphan medical specialty. All that research and no one to read it. It doesn't have a name, so I named it testosterone deficiency syndrome because it's not andropause, that's men's. So we need our own name. And it's not perimenopause because it has nothing to do with estrogen, has nothing to do with the loss of estrogen. It comes way before that. It's the first thing to go. And symptoms in research are researched with testosterone and one symptom, never the group of sim symptoms. I realize that that's much more difficult to do in research, but they aren't calling it a syndrome. All these symptoms that go along with it uh, are there, and they should look at all of them together. Okay, so the syndrome, we've looked over some of the, talked about some of the uh, aspects of why we don't know about it or why our patients don't know about it as well. So these are the symptoms, and this is on your, on uh, the web, and so you can download it. I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is one, this is similar to what we give our patients for their questionnaire. And then what are the treatments that we give patients that decrease their testosterone? A lot of, uh, all of these are used very frequently for good reason, but they decrease testosterone. So you need to be aware of that because sometimes patients don't have such a low testosterone. They just need to be taken off one of these drugs and given something like fish oil or red rice yeast or something instead of a statin, something that's not going to impair their testosterone. Testosterone replacement is efficient. It is one hormone, one hormone we used to make, and very few side effects. I mean, hair, hair on your face compared to all this other stuff? I mean, a little hair, you can have a waxed off. But we have ways to prevent that as well. That's not commensurate with having all of these illnesses that we could just take one hormone for, and we'd feel great and have sex. So it's a very efficient answer, which most people in government are looking for, but no one's looking at this. So testosterone loss is the first step in aging. It's the first hormone to go, usually in most women. So this is just kind of a visual. Aging starts with testosterone loss, and then in women, that, well, that triggers growth hormone decrease. Then usually progesterone in, independently decreases, and then the last one, number three, is estradiol. So, or you can look at, like, these stair steps. I was trying to learn to do this stuff on the computer, so bear with me. <laughs> it doesn't look that great. Okay, so symptoms of the aging cascade. We've talked about TDS. Growth hormone uh, deficiency ha is a loss of lean body mass and more fat, loss of muscle mass, poor healing. And then progesterone, of course, is PMS, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, and irritability. Irritability is big. We, that sometimes is low testosterone and sometimes progesterone. So if the testosterone doesn't kick it, we, we add progesterone even if there's no uterus. A, nat a bioidentical progesterone, if and usually for, if they're cycling, just day 14 through 28. Estradiol deficiency, that's the last step, and then it's kind of over in terms of changing. That causes hot flashes, dry vagina, and dyspareunia. And in med school, all the guys, I was in med school when there were seven women, and there were 112 doctors, so seven of us survived that. And they used to say things like, 
Does perunia is better than no perunia at all? Well, I can guarantee you that it's not. <laughs> I mean, no perunia at all is much better than that. It's like sandpaper. So, long-term effects of TDS, the diseases of aging. If you don't replace testosterone, that, then the things that happen associated with aging are going to happen faster and more, and more severely. So the structural diseases that occur, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, if anybody doesn't, wasn't here earlier, that's loss of muscle mass, and that's what really makes people unable to live alone. They can't get around. They don't have any muscle. They're, they're, all, they're all bent over. That's not their bones. That's their muscles. And testosterone maintains muscle mass. Frailty is the outcome of sarcopenia, where people are, like, breakable. They're like little glass dolls. And you have to be very careful because they look like they're going to break. And they can't take care of themselves because they're afraid. They step off a curb, they might break something. And then, of course, obesity. Testosterone is, the, is one, of, one of the functions of testosterone is to make you insulin sensitive. So it, um, it actually combats obesity. Inflammatory diseases, we talked about this a little bit. Autoimmune disorders, atherosclerotic heart disease, Alzheimer's, testosterone is an anti-inflammatory. It kind of does it all. So it's just as good in women as it is in men. It does the same stuff. So why don't we get it? It's kind of like, I want it too. I mean, everybody, it's okay for guys that, in my state, they pay for it for men. Even uh, for bioidentical pellets in general. But they are not going to pay for women. Illness due to long-term depletion, and that goes through depression, neurotransmitter uh, deficiency, Anxiety. Anxiety is usually from constant hot flashes, the surges of FSH and LH, anxiety attacks. Those I see a lot with men when I'm treating men, and um, they don't get hot. They get anxious. It goes away in a minute, but they're miserable because they're in a meeting, and it's driving them crazy, but women do the same thing. But they're waiting for the hot flash, but they get the anxiety instead. <clears throat> Parkinson's disease is one that we hardly ever talk about with testosterone, but testosterone stimulates dopamine. So it decreases the rate of um, disintegration, if you will, Parkinson's disease. And improving your immune system always protects you from cancer. So physiology, this is really, really basic. So don't... <laughs> this is, this is my, little, my little graph. Ovaries make the majority of testosterone when we're in our fertile stage before we hit menopause. Actually, after menopause, no, we don't have much at all anyway. But testosterone has an effect on the adrenal. When testosterone drops, the adrenal makes more estrone. Estrone is the hormone of belly fat, breast tenderness, breast cancer. Estrone's the bad guy. It makes us all, both men and women, have the 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 apple shape, and it really does decrease your memory. It, it affects how you think. So estrone then goes and makes, it actually stimulates belly fat. So belly fat then stimulates weight gain, which makes more estrone, because fat makes more estrone. <laughs> so it's one of those very few positive feedback systems in the body that it just keeps positive, positive, positive. It's impossible to stop this process unless you block it or you give testosterone. If you give testosterone, then testosterone will start the process the other direction. It will decrease the production from the adrenal. Or you could use a Rimidex, which also decreases testosterone's conversion into estrone. So those are the two methods, but giving testosterone is the easiest. It's kind of a one, one treatment, and it fixes everything else. This is what I kind of draw in my office on my piece of paper where I'm drawing for everybody. This is what happens when your testosterone drops, your estrone goes up. So they have a picture in their mind so they know what's happening when they go home and they don't get confused. So this is the effect of estrone on women. And migraine headaches are in there too. And that's one of the things I, we do the best with testosterone. We have, a, we have neurologists that send me migraine headache, migraineurs that are in the right uh, age bracket, anything over 30, 38, or people who have had their ovaries removed earlier or at any time, they send to me, and we have a, a really good record of treating this. Unless they have a different trigger, sometimes there's a few triggers, but we take care of the hormonal trigger by giving them testosterone. 
it actually modulates the neurotransmitters and stops the um, vascular um, dilation in the brain. E1 really has very few redeeming qualities, except it can make a little bone, but other things can too. There's a three-way relationship that not many people talk about between estradiol and testosterone. But when we first look at lab, you should look at the estradiol and estrone ratio. When we're young, we have a two-to-one ratio, estradiol to estrone. When, as we lose testosterone, our estradiol goes down, our estrone goes up. That's one of the ways I make sure that when I see a low testosterone, I look at this ratio and confirm that, yes, the patient has the, has the effects of low testosterone because their estrone is higher than their estradiol. So this is one of those things that can be balanced with testosterone, but it also can be imbalanced by taking other hormones that are or, like oral ERT that are synthetic or the patch or the synthetic gel. All of those were synthetic except the bioidentical vag tabs. But at the very top, you see that a youthful ovary makes two to one estradiol, young to old. And at the very bottom, bioidentical pellets is the only one that can recreate the two to one ratio. Everything else in between is not as good, which is one of the reasons I only do pellets now. Because I find estrone to be a huge problem. So pellets take care of that. Yin and yang of testosterone. So this is the difference between men and women, but I just put the women's slides in here or I'm going to go over. <laughs> but men have 10 times as much testosterone as women, but that doesn't mean we don't need it. I mean, it's just that they have more. Female um, age of testosterone deficiency is 45. Average age for men is 55. Yet I'm starting to see younger and younger men in the office, which is really scary. They're 40, and they've got a testosterone of a 70-year-old. So what's doing that? I have no idea. They didn't have head injuries. I go through the whole thing. There's nothing that happened to them, and they're really low. They may not tell me about any anabolic steroids they used in the past, however, because they're afraid to tell about that. So they're not, they're not fertile in general, and they've do, they're done with childbearing, so, or child child making. So we're, so we're okay with giving them their testosterone back. Testosterone, the gender difference, age of testosterone deficiency is different, is different by 10 years. One of the reasons why there's so much trouble in marriages, because men are fine, <laughs> and then their wives may be a few years younger, but they hit testosterone deficiency sooner, and they don't want to have sex anymore. And the men say, oh, you changed the deal. So that's one of the reasons I believe that we see all the uh, divorces in the 40s, when women are in their 40s, because that's when the deal changes. They don't want to have sex anymore, and their husbands go, wait a second, this isn't what I signed up for. If we did it at the same time, we probably wouldn't notice. <laughs> testosterone blood levels, high, 10 times higher in men than women, and free testosterone levels are about the same, 10 times higher in men than women. So if you look at women's total testosterone in the blood of a young, healthy woman, woman, which is what you need to compare them to, not the numbers on the lab test, you, you should have 30 to 75. That's what women between 20 and 40 have. We compare women's bones to a 29-year-old female. When we do the bone density test, we should be doing that with all of our lab tests. So this is comparing women that you see that are older to a young, healthy woman. And so this is the normal total testosterone, but really the money's where the free testosterone is. And it, I look at 7 to 10 nanograms. It depends on the lab. And free testosterone is very hard to measure, very hard to measure. So usually I find that treating people who are less than 7 to 10, is some, they will be, it will be very effective and they'll feel better. Total T is not the test to judge adequate replacement after you've given it to them. Because total T is a number that is a lot higher in women to get them the necessary free T. We have a lot of sex hormone binding globulin. We have a lot of other hormones and a lot of steroids like cortisol. We have a lot of stress. That helps bind up our testosterone. So I look at just free T. I don't even order the total T because the mainstream internal medicine guys freak if they see a woman with a testosterone of 200. 
And it doesn't mean anything because their free testosterone is probably 10. So it's not a lot, but they don't know what that means. So they just freak over the total testosterone. And it's not doing anything to them. It's totally inert. So free testosterone mirrors the symptoms that women have. So that's why we should follow it. It also crosses the blood-brain barrier, which is why it's very important for us to look at that particular um, hormone. And it shows the balance between sex hormone binding globulin and testosterone. Factors that lower free T, free T levels are estrogen replacement, estrogen dominance, even if no one's taking estrogen. If you take their um, estrogen or estradiol level and it's 400, then they are stimulating their sex hormone binding glob globulin and they're lowering the free T level. Alcohol intake, cortisol stress, even elevated albumin. The diagnosis and treatment of testosterone deficiency the risks are the biggest issues, and the risks aren't big. Facial hair. Okay, you can have it taken off. You can use, you can use spironolactone. I'll go over the treatments or the prevention in a second. But thinning hair at the temples, that's a little bit more difficult to deal with. And uh, return to body hair, like on your arms, legs. If you had a belly, belly body hair and you're female, then you'll get it back. Basically, whatever you had when you were 30 comes back. And that's not always happy for most women because they thought they were done with it. But a lot of good things happen, too. Temporary risks, clitoral enlargement, it comes and goes. Usually, I don't understand the big hubbub about that because no men ever have complained to me about their penis getting larger with testosterone. I just don't get it why everybody's excited about this. In medicine, obviously, if you're not taking anything and you have a large clitoris, it might mean that you had a tumor of the ovary, which I've never seen in all the years that I practiced gynecology. So I don't know why anybody's excited about that. It goes away after the body gets used to the treatment. And so I don't find that to be an issue um, for any of my patients. Now, a lower voice in singers is an issue. And anybody who's had a damage or radiation to their vocal cords Lowering their voice or making it less easy to hear if they've had, if they've had radiation or, or some other kind of surgery to their vocal cords might be a problem. And in that way, you either have to use finasteride to block the DHT, which is the active uh, ingredient that's causing that, or you have to lower the dose so that they don't, or, or in singers, you have to maybe not give them testosterone, just give them estradiol. It depends on what they agree to when they know the risk, because it is their choice. And then excessive libido in older patients, sometimes that's a huge problem. So women who don't have a partner or don't know how to use a toy or a vibrator, I have long talks with them, and that, I don't get very far. They're very uncomfortable with it. So oftentimes I'll just lower the testosterone dose. Then they come back and say, well, hey, I don't feel as good as I did before. So I, I tell them they have to make the choice. So it's either... You have, to, you have to order something from drugstore.com in a little black, brown box that comes in the mail and put some batteries in it, or we ha you're not going to feel as good because there's a trade-off, and they have to be able to be the ones that make it. So, and the biggest, I think the biggest prob problem with testosterone in women is women have to either be menopausal or they have to have permanent birth control. And birth control pills don't work because they negate the effects of the testosterone that we're trying to get. So they, it stimulates the sex hormone binding globulin so much that we can't get a good resolution of symptoms. Condoms aren't adequate. You just can't have a baby. It's category X. It's going to make a girl baby look like a boy baby. That's just not going to happen. So they have to sign their consent. On that consent has to say, I am using permanent birth control or something, or I'm menopausal. Otherwise, they don't get their pellets. So choosing a delivery system, getting short on time. Um, I use subcutaneous pellets, but a lot of people use other types of, of creams, gels, buckle tablets. It depends on your pharmacy and how good they are. And most, most patients may want to choose. I mean, I just like to use the pellets because it's very low risk in terms of phone calls, and it's, it's low risk in terms of dangers of them imagining they've got something. I know what they're getting. I'm putting it in. I don't have to think maybe they put on 10 times as much or maybe they took 10 times as much, so I'm in control of that. 
So yeah, maybe I have a control issue. But it makes it easier to answer phone calls when you know exactly what hormone they got when and how long it's supposed to last and what their last blood test was. And I think that the, the lab tests are much more relevant when you're doing pellets. Sometimes I do lab tests on vag tabs and they're like a thousand. The patient still doesn't feel well and her symptoms aren't better. So I don't even know how to, I don't have, know how to evaluate that. So for me, and I'm just saying for me, you guys have your own uh, opinions on this. This is why I do pellets. It's much easier to manage for me. And it seems to have a much better outcome for the patient. They feel really much better and within four weeks. These are the cost issues. You can look at this a little bit later, but it turns out that if your patient has to pay for any bioidentical hormone, then they have to look at the cost issues. Usually oral will be paid for by insurance, but they've taken ester test. I, at least we can't get it, so I think it's off the market. I didn't look that up for the recent uh, availability of it, but that's the cheapest, but methyl testosterone is really bad for you, and it causes a lot of anger and liver tumors, so I wouldn't suggest that. But all the other bioidentical hormones end up being about 100 a month, unless you're in a really good area that, or have a really inexpensive pharmacy. And pellets end up being 125 to 175 a month if you pay per month. So it's not that outrageous, and they usually get off some of their other medications if they're on the pellets. So it usually is about a wash, and they feel really good. Goals for dosage, relief of symptoms, and no voice change. Basically, blood levels of T-free is higher than physiologic. So that's partially because we lose androgen receptors as we get older, and we have to flood them. So that's what I found is that usually you have to have a higher free T to get the outcome, but we don't have any downside to that. Each patient has a different ideal level of T, so that's one of the things that you have to mark on the chart. This is ideal. This is where we want to be. This is where she feels good, and and have that, and have that um, on their chart so you look for it, and you remember it. This is me putting a pellet in. That's an estrogen estradiol pellet into a trocar. My pellet dosage and frequency is for women 125 to 300, depending on a lot of things. But um, that's complicated, and that would take way too much time for this lecture. We redose every three to six months. And that seems to be adequate. Usually the six months is in older patients or sedentary patients. And the three months are in those, those I call them hummingbirds. They're always moving. They never sleep. They, you know, they run marathons. You know, those are, those are people that have to have this more often. So blood lab goals for testosterone pellets. We do a first morning draw. We don't draw the total testosterone. We just draw the free. And we're looking for, after the pellets, we're looking for 15 to 40 nanograms per deciliter. That's what we're looking for. And usually in that range, people feel awesome. We want the DHT to be less than 20. That's Quest, Quest normals. And estradiol to be less than half of the, excuse me, estrone to be less than half of the estradiol. LH less than 10, just because we want to make sure testosterone does affect the LH. So we both F, LH and estradiol, um, excuse me, testosterone and estradiol affect LH, so we want to ha have it less than 10 so they don't have night sweats or, or hot flashes. Troubleshooting, this is what you were looking for, unwanted facial hair. Spironolactone, ideal dose is 100 milligrams a day. They shouldn't be on any other diuretic, so you're either going to have to change them from their diuretic with the approval of their internist or their family practice doctor, or if you're the family practice doctor, you've got to change them, but... 100 milligrams is ideal for preventing hair growth. And usually I start people who have had hair growth when they were younger on spironolactone when we start the pellets so that we can prevent it. Uh, if it's really difficult to manage, we use finasteride, but we only use half of a, of a 5 milligram tablet. And I use 5 milligrams because the women's dose is 1 milligram and it's three times as expensive and there's no generic. So I use the men's Proscar dose and I have them cut it in half and, and decrease it to once a week. Some people take it half once a day, but I don't have very many people like that. So that's to keep the DHT in the hair follicle in check. And then weight gain, we, we try to control estrone. So testosterone does part of it. Dim extra strength does part of it. And in some cases, we have to use Arimidex. 
in the pellet or orally, but you know, the side effect of Arimidex is arthritic symptoms, and we're trying to get rid of those, so we don't want patients to have arthritic symptoms. So I usually try the pellet first, see if I can get their, their weight down, their belly fat down. This is, a, this is one thing that I just want to mention, and we're right at the end, genetic aromatization defect. These are people who are usually Southern European, but of course I find them everywhere uh, because Rome went everywhere and there's, there were a lot of invasions. <laughs> but when there are a lot of people that at a certain point, both men and women, they start converting their testosterone in a big way into estrone. And it's genetic. So what you see with a pellet or with estrogen replacement, or testosterone, excuse me, replacement is, give them their testosterone for the first two to three weeks, they start feeling great, it's awesome, and then all of a sudden, their breasts don't fit into their clothes, and their belly fat increases, and they gain weight. And so there's no test that I can do that's actually reasonable to find out if they have this problem, but... That's the sign. The sign is all of a sudden, instead of feeling really good, they feel really bad, and they start out feeling really, really good. And then I usually ask them about their family tree, but I do that ahead of time. I don't always get it right, but um, it doesn't always follow family trees. However, treating with, est treating with DIM initially, estradiol orally until the next pellet dose is very very treatable, very curable, and then with the next pellet dose, we use Arimidex and testosterone in the pellet. So then they don't have to deal with another, another um, medication. So the excessive aromatization of T to, to estrone, you can read this, causes more migraines. So oftentimes, this is a big deal. They came to me for migraines, they quit, then they start up with a vengeance. So this is something that I have to keep my eye out for, and so should you. They found this in a study that was done on men in Sicily because they found that men in Sicily had the highest rate of male breast cancer. That's where they found the aromatase enzyme, and that's where they, and from that came Arimidex and all the other aromatase inhibitors. But that's how they found it. So the highest rate of breast cancer and aromatase defect is in Sicily. I'm half, I'm half Sicilian, so I got to enjoy this. Um, deal on my first dose. I felt great for four weeks, and then, whoa, I couldn't fit any of my clothes. So this is the treatment. Troubleshooting the excessive sex drive we talked about. It usually e equilibrates in about two weeks, and then the clitoral enlargement, I forgot to talk about the estrogen. You can apply estrogen cream to the clitoris, and that tends to calm it down, but once again, I don't think it's a problem. It usually goes away, or gets goes back to normal on its own. So the logic for patients not taking testosterone is not logical because they say, I don't, I don't want to put anything in my body. Okay, well, you use aspirin, you take, you, you get a flu shot, you, I mean, everything you do nowadays is something in your body, plus they're drinking uh, soda with, you know, <laughs> out of a plastic cup. I mean, that's not a logical, expl that's not a logical argument. So some people aren't going to listen, but I just say, you know, it's going to improve your health. It's going to make you feel better, and your husband will be a lot happier, and you'll be a lot happier. So that's, that's kind of how I explain it at my office, and sometimes I get through, and sometimes I don't. Um, <laughs> we have had all of our testosterone uh, products prevented from passing through the FDA because of things like facial hair growth. Not, nobody died. Nobody, I mean, it was not a medical, life-threatening problem. It's ridiculous. It's made everybody afraid of testosterone, mostly women. And these are the things that are keeping us from medical equality. Testosterone is not just for men. This is my benediction. I can, hear the, I can hear the choir. It's not just for men. We must get FDA approval for some testosterone for us to get payment for our bioidentical testosterone. Um, we have to change the societal beliefs about women over 40. We're not all crazy. We're not all hot flashing and non-productive. We're not all fat. You know, we actually are productive human beings in society, and they need to treat us like that. And that's something that only we can do in this room by having discussions with our patients. And women also must get over their fear of everything that shows up in the newspaper. And I know you all deal with that every day. People bring in articles. Look at this. It's scary. This is scary. 
And we've heard this weekend or this conference all about uh, headlines that are wrong. And the, all of the information is wrong, but it's still a headline in JAMA. So we have to counteract that or we're not going to get anywhere. So that's why I wanted to make this, t I wanted to talk. And, and I wanted to talk here because I know everyone here deals with treatments that are on the cutting edge that are creative human beings who are trying to make their patients better. And I just hope that you can join with your patients in trying to get the rest of the world to see, what, see the beauty of actually giving women the same treatment as you all get, you all guys get. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention.